Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. I'm Dr. Millicent Rovello, and I'm here today with my wonderfully amazing co-host, Dr. Jay Calvert. How are you? I'm good. I, I was going to, I thought you were going to say you're drainless, painless co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it because I thought it would, it, it had to come out, but that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the drainless, painless abdominoplasty. Um, because I mean, really? Uh, uh, mm. Really? <laughs> so what is that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna reserve my comments until later. <laughs> you need to reel me in right away because I'm already there. You know? He's coming in hot, folks. <laughs> so this kind of goes back to previous episodes we've done or anything we've talked about before, where we really sort of say, you know, a lot of the things that are labeled in plastic surgery, you know, given a name, given a trademark, there's a lot of social media marketing hashtags associated with that. And this one kind of has one as well, the drainless, painless tummy tuck. Um, But there's a reason for why it's called that. And we can get into what that is um, and whether or not that in fact is the case. So in a traditional old school you know, classic abdominoplasty, you have your skin incision, which is at the bottom of the abdomen. We can get into that later, <laughs> what I just recently saw. <laughs> oh, man. Do we need to talk about no. that or what? Not not, not on this podcast. That's going to be filed under WTF. Can we just do WTF. like a little... Now, hold on a second. <laughs> I just want a timeout. Can, can't we do that? Like, let's do this podcast. Like, we're doing it, right? Everybody's listening, and it's going well. But I think we need a little dessert at the end. And okay. we'll, we'll just... we'll. Take it at that. Okay. Stay tuned, listeners. Yes. A little nugget. Um, <laughs> but a classic abdominal incision, lower abdomen, hip to hip. Like a smile. Like a smile. I saw one like a smile. And then the excess skin is removed. Usually something's done with a belly button to move it around in space and release it from the skin above it. And then the rectus muscles, the six-pack muscles, are pulled together in the midline After pregnancy, after weight loss, usually they're separated a little bit. That's called a rectus diastasis. So you repair those with sutures, bring them back in the midline, tighten everything up, plus minus some liposuction of fatty areas, and then you zip everything up and you put in one or two drains. Drains are small silicone tubes that exit your skin and they collect in a little drain bulb at the end. And then the patient's job over the next week or two is to empty that bowl, record how much comes out, and then at some point they're removed in the office setting. And that is a classic way of treating fluid accumulation. And why do you need them? Because anytime you do that amount of work in an area, the body's response to that trauma is to produce fluid. And so if you don't have drains in there, the fluid will accumulate under the skin, and that's called a seroma, which you then have to drain in some other fashion. So drains are a classic way of treating these fluid collections that occur after surgery. Yeah, and those fluid collections are very real. (laughs) If you pull a drain too early... (laughs) You learn the hard way. Oh, yeah. And you get these big seromas, um, and a seroma is just because it's serum. It's the the fluid part of the blood that just sort of accumulates in these areas, and they can be a lot of fluid. They can be a lot of fluid. They can be hundreds of cc's. They can be... And they're so annoying. And if they stay too long, then they, they actually get like a capsule on them, like yeah. a rind. And they become permanent. Yeah, and then you have to operate to get rid of them. So right. we don't want to get fluid accumulations. Correct. So then the other way of addressing fluid accumulations, instead of doing an actual drain, is to do what's called a drainless tummy tuck. And the way that works is by addressing sort of the root problem of the drainage is of the drainage is that there's this space where the fluid's accumulating. So you can put internal sutures on the inside of the abdomen from the skin level-ish down to the abdominal wall, and you usually do those down the center, down the midline, off to the sides, off to the corners, and by doing so, you obliterate that potential space, and it makes it much harder for fluid to accumulate. So the idea is that if you put enough of these sutures down, you tack the skin down to the abdominal wall, you create a way for fluid to basically never accumulate, and you don't have to put a drain, hence why it's drain less. Yeah, and and it works. It's uh, in fact, I've I've been a fan of these uh, progressive tension sutures uh, since I kind of started hearing about them. It took me a while to figure out how I really wanted to do it because 
it changes your operation a little bit. On a little how, bit. A little bit. And, and how and you so, do this, uh, how you pull the skin. Because the other thing, the reason they're called progressive tension sutures is because they're also taking tension off the skin and redistributing it so that when you get to the very bottom where your incision is, where the, the skin is excised and closed, there's theoretically less tension on that area so your scar should heal better because the tension's been redistributed over the whole abdomen. Yeah, and we talked about this on our, <clears throat> dare I say it, reverse abdominoplasty yes. podcast. <laughs> but we talked about doing the progressive tensions in that setting and it was very effective. By the way, patient, very happy. <laughs> um, but in the abdominoplasty, this this uh, maneuver of putting in these stitches from the uh, rectus fascia and the external oblique fascia to the, the flap, to the skin flap above, and then tying it down, it, it really does kind of eliminate the need for drains, though I always put one. I'm always just a, put I'm one. So, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm such a chicken. Because, and, and here's the thing, um, there are plenty of surgeons that never put drains that only do the drainless ones, and that's great. And if you listen to their data or read their data, you know, they have a very small seroma rate. For me... But they have a seroma rate. I don't like seromas. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them, I hate them, I hate them. So if I'm, I kind of have, um, I have, I have tiers of patients. And mostly in my massive weight loss patients where I'm removing, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of skin and flesh, um, they're getting two drains. Like, don't even ask me. Like, don't come at me. You're getting two drains and they're going to stay there for three weeks. Maybe not both of them, but at least one. Because I really, they're going to, create a lot of fluid just because of how much work is done to remove their extra skin. And they get mad at me and they don't want their drains in, but it's the holidays and it's the weekend and it's my daughter's graduation. Tough. You shouldn't have booked a surgery that close to anything because I need those drains to be putting up very little before I remove them. And you know what? I don't get seromas. That's right. I do. I mean, all of us do here and there. But for how many I do for the large amount of patients that I have, you know, it's a very low rate. Now, if I have a non-weight loss patient, someone who really doesn't need a whole lot of work, maybe they're a mom, they have some extra skin, they have some rectus diastasis, I'll do the progressive tension sutures, but I still leave one drain because, again, I don't want to be dealing with a seroma because I get scared that it's going to turn into a chronic seroma, and I don't want to have to go back and reopen them to remove it. Well, and that's the whole point. It's about the result. It isn't about whether, you know, you impress your friends with your, you know, tricks and, and these kind of techniques. You want a great result. And a seroma kind of wrecks kind of, the result. Kind of wrecks it. And yes, it is an extra step for the patient. Sure. They have a tube hanging off of them for a couple of weeks. They have to empty it twice a day or once a day. Yes, it does make that initial two-week process of recovery a little bit more cumbersome, but like a little bit because a little bit. the whole process can be cumbersome. So I think, in my opinion, that extra little bit of cumbersomeness is worth it to not have to deal with a complication down the road or at least know that we did everything possible to prevent a complication. Yeah, and some of those drains in, the, uh, in those... Uh progressive tension suture closed abdomens put out a lot. They put out a lot. Yeah, they do. And it's like, yeah. well, if you didn't have the drain, like where's Where that fluid going? Where is it going? going? Where is it going? I a thousand percent agree, especially if you did a ton of liposuction and you have all that fluid floating around in there. And the other benefit, I think it's um it's a I think it's a benefit, although I have had some issues, is that when you do the progressive tension sutures, you do get a nice contour to the abdomen. So it sort of recreates what looks like a six pack because those sutures go down the midline. So it creates sort of that six pack internal divot down the center, the champagne line, if you will. And then you get the ones on the sides of the rectus to define the edges. And then you get some along the external obliques on the bottom. So you sort of pseudo create what looks like a, a six pack definition. Now, once these sutures absorb, which they all do in three to four weeks, some of that definition goes away, but some of it stays, um, which is another reason actually I don't do it in my massive weight loss patients, because if I do that midline row of sutures down the center in a patient that has really uh, any 
inelastic floppy skin. It looks like they have like a butt crease in the middle. It Mm. doesn't, the skin like (laughs) folds in on it. Because even though I've removed a ton of skin, the skin that's left behind is not great quality. So it doesn't stay taut and look like a six pack. It just folds in and looks like a center butt. So those patients, a front butt. A ventral butt. They don't like it. They're like, why do I have a vagina in the center of my abdomen? (laughs) Uh, That wasn't the uh, intention. We weren't going for that. Sorry about that. Uh, So there are some patients that like... That's why for my massive weight loss, they don't get progressive tension. They get two drains and a story next. But for the non-weight loss patients, the young mommies, the more fit, um, you know, thin people, it's great for them. It really does. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you just have to do what you, you're comfortable with. But I do love the progressive tension sutures. I think they look amazing. Yeah. I, I just the the contours that I've been able to get, and mm-hmm. that was – that like, this is – this is where like these advances, you have to like try them out. You know, there are all these, you know, things get published constantly, you know, and I, <laughs> one thing that happened in, in, uh, in Germany was I was, you know, I kind of raised my hand about, uh, you know, taking care of infected dorsal implants. And this is something that goes back to Pittsburgh where like, you know, uh, someone in China has done a hundred to a thousand times more of whatever it is you think you've done a lot of <laughs> because it, there's just so many people. There's in just China. so much more. There's just so many people there. And like, it totally happened there. I was like, Oh, so I've got a series of eight patients we're publishing with infected <laughs> implants. And you know, of course the guy from South Korea was like, Oh yeah, I, I published one of like, you know, 96 patients. <laughs> and, the, and then the, you know, the guy from Taiwan was like, yeah, yeah we published 320 and yeah, we did them all this way too. I was like, Okay, I'll shut up. Because, <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say? But that's the thing, like, with this progressive tension sutures, like, everybody was doing them. They're like, oh, we're into it, we're into it. And I was like, all right, let me, let me, like, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta, like, sniff this one a little yeah. bit, like, make sure it's cool. You know, I gotta check it out. I gotta, and so I did a little bit, and then I did a little, and you gotta walk up to it. You can't go all in with new techniques because some of them just don't fly. They, they aren't, they don't have staying power, they're not necessary. And, uh, you as the surgeon, like, this is why you get people that kind of pay attention. You know, like if you're going to go to a surgeon, make sure it's somebody who's paying attention, attending the conferences, you know, getting their CMEs, all the things that, that kind of say that, you know, my, my surgeon's thinking a little bit and they haven't checked out and they're going with what they learned as a resident. 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it is so like plastic surgery today. And what I was trained in are two completely different right. specialties. It is not even close. Yeah, it evolves constantly. Constantly, yeah. uh, your your practice is different every six to nine months. I think. Yeah, no, I think that's probably reasonable. And then that's so. Then that brings us to the painless part of it. Do your abdominal plasty patients have pain, Doctor Calvert? They, they seem to. I mean, I don't, I don't know how. Horrible surgeon. How dare your how patients have pain? Say, I don't know how people say that. Oh, there's no pain. Like, what are you talking about? If you did the abdominoplasty the right way, how is it not going to have some pain? Now, I can do tons of things to control it. Of course. Yeah. yeah lots of local lots injections. Lots of things we yeah. can do. And so the, the painless part of it, it does. It starts preoperatively. So there's a little cocktail of medication that you can get before surgery. It's a combination of Celebrex, which is an uh, anti-inflammatory. You can also do gabapentin, which is a nerve medication. You can do Tylenol, which also helps with pain. So you give all these medications before the patient goes to surgery, and that sort of stunts or blocks some of the pain receptors before they're even allowed to be affected. And then at the time of surgery, usually towards the end of surgery, we inject a numbing medication, kind of like a lidocaine, a long-acting lidocaine, into the rectus muscles, down to where the nerves are that stimulate or supply the abdomen. And that provides long-lasting pain relief. And the kind of uh, medication you inject can vary. There is a lot, the longest acting one that we have is called Expirel. Um, and that theoretically lasts for 72 hours. Then there's also things like Marcaine, which lasts anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. You can do fake Sprel, which is Marcaine with some steroids, and it lasts for almost 72 hours as well. So these are all things that people can do at the time of abdominoplasty to improve your pain experience. Um, have you used the fake Sprel? I have. Yeah, yeah, it works. It works. I, I think so too. It totally works. I mean, because the whole concept is, is that with Sprel, it's... Uh, it's like, it's a, fo- like, like fossilized, like 
Lyophilized. Lyophilized. That's the word. Easy for you to say. Yeah, I cannot. <laughs> it is not easy. For <laughs> Which you to means say. that the the marcaine is in a little fat bubble, basically, and yeah. as the fat bubble breaks down, it releases the marcaine um, into the local area, and and it it supposedly works over three days or so. And yeah. I I've, I've seen that. I think so. It's just super pricey. It's super pricey. Um, but it's definitely, you can get it. I use it at the hospitals um, until the pharmacy told me that I was no longer allowed to use it because it was too expensive. It is. And I said, excuse me, well then why do you have it in the pharmacy unless you want people to use You're supposed to, you have it and you stock it <laughs> to be used, but then you came at me and asked me to not use it. So what did I do? I just kept using it. Absolutely. <laughs> so I use it, but, that, but even the hospitals were like, eh. It's expensive. It is. Um, and we can use it at the surgery centers. Um, a lot of times we do the fake sprawl, which I think works just as well because I have both patients. I see them, the hospital ones and then my surgery center ones, and they seem to have similar pain experiences. Yeah, the the um, steroid has a lot of that fatty sort of... Right, so it, it you know, lyophilizes. That, yeah, it does it for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it works and uh, and that helps, but I, I, I don't think an abdominoplasty is painless. I think that's a that's a stretch. And I, yeah. I don't market it as such. I mean, I guess we're doing a podcast called <laughs> Painless, you know, Painless Strainless, strainless <laughs> Abdominoplasty, but it's not because we think that that's the case. I don't, you know, and I think it, I, I give my patients fairly across the board a standard amount of pain medicine postoperatively, and it's pretty small doses. I think the max um, amount of pain pills that I give is like 15 to 20. And in a blue moon, I will have someone ask for a refill, yeah. like twice a year, maybe at most. So my patients don't really need pain medicine after a few days or even a week. They're right. off of it. And there are other things we do. We give them muscle relaxants. We go back to the Celebrex. So there are other cocktails that you can take. But I use that kind of as a marker that patients don't get that much pain medicine and they don't ask for refills. So I, I think they do okay. I, I'm sure they do. They, I mean... Abdominoplasties are, in and of themselves, you know, not terribly painful. I think they become more painful when you have to do a hernia repair. Do a hernia repair or lots of liposuction. That's where yeah. my patients really feel it is the yeah. liposuction areas. But at the same time, like if you go into this going, you know, I'm going to have surgery and there's going to be some pain and I'm going to get through it and it's going to be fine and it's a limited time, then it's then you do okay. It's how you set your expectations. And I have some patients that come in terrified to do the surgery. They don't want to do the surgery because they are so terrified about the pain. And I tell them all these things too, and, and then they sign up and they're like, oh, it was fine. Yep. But here's the one other thing I will say um, before we get to our little nugget. <laughs> Be very careful about the horror stories that you hear, see, and read on the internet and social media because everyone loves to portray themselves as a martyr, that they came through the most awful experience and they were so strong and they survived. They want to tell their story to the world to get credit for how strong they are. So they will say, it was so painful and it was so hard and they will exaggerate to the nth degree. And those are the stories that terrify potential patients is like why it's going to be so awful. And then they have it and they're like, that was nothing. That was fine. Like, yeah, don't listen to the people that give like the super horror stories because chances are they're just exaggerating, you know, their experience. Or maybe they did have a one-off really bad experience, but that's not the typical. No, it's not. And in fact, the other part of my practice that's like that is the removal of the Doyle splints. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody comes in like, oh, my God, I, I, you're going to take these out? I was like, yes, I'm going to take them out. Oh, what do you have to do? I, I said, I'm going to cut a stitch and slide them out. No big deal. And these are the splints that go in the nose, and they're there after surgery when I do septal work. And uh, and then I inevitably cut the stitch, slide them out, and they're like, wait, wh when's it starting? Is it over? I was like, yeah, it's out. that's it. Yeah. So like, I've been nervous about this for three weeks. I was like, yeah, I told you it wasn't any big deal. Yep. That's why I show my TikTok. It's on my TikTok having, you know, my fellows splints coming out. There's a ton of it on my Instagram all over the place. And, you know, any of these things, you just have to realize, like, talk to the surgeon. They'll they'll shoot you straight. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not going to lie to you about, about it. I'll, I'll say it's uncomfortable, you know, but it's fine. You'll get through it. That's right. So I think, that, I think that's it. Well, let's talk about your nugget. Oh. Let's go for dessert here on this. <laughs> so first of all, when you're getting... 
I, I, I almost mean, can't. Like, I'm so traumatized. I know you are. <laughs> I could tell. And and you should be. And and we all are a little bit because I saw that incision and I was just like, whoa. I mean, I, I just, I don't know what was happening there. I think there. you have to tell the story because I right, can't. I'll tell it. So anyway, Dr. Ravel is taking care of a patient who flew elsewhere to another state uh, to get I don't know what, a, what this head, operation is. A head and is. neck I don't, procedure. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was yeah. going for some sort of uh, scar vision, and they got to Texas for this operation. And on the day of surgery. And, and Yeah. And on the day of surgery, decided, like, I think I'll have an abdominoplasty <laughs> on the day of surgery. Oh, by the way, hey, doc, while yeah. you're there. And, and I call those hey, docs. But to me, a hey, doc is like, hey, doc, while you're doing my nose, can you take this mole off? And okay. I said, yeah, if it's on the consent, I'll take care of it. And, you know, so those kind of hey, docs are fine. But this was, hey, doc, how about an abdominoplasty? <laughs> and this patient did not really need the abdominoplasty. A little bit of extra skin, sort of in the, the middle uh, area around the belly button. So somehow this surgeon I designed an operation that included a cross-the-belly incision at the level of the belly button. Side like cut, to side. Right, and, and I, I saw that and I go... Wait, maybe he was in a magic show and the magician tried to cut him in half and almost did because that's what it looked like to me. That's what it looks like. It's it does. It looks like somebody took a saw and went right across the, the middle. middle of the abdomen. It's really bad. And one piece of advice, if the operation, if you're, if you're making up the operation, like think twice about it just because like there's a reason that operations that are done don't. a certain way. There's a reason that there's tried, true, tested, loads of data on the operations that we do. And and you can make up operations. I do it way more than than most people I know of because the problems that are presented to me are totally right. crazy. And I do need to create operations. But like an abdominoplasty is an abdominoplasty. Make a low incision. Take it. Don't like the... The mid abdom like that we used to do like mid abdominal trams actually when back in the day when we were doing tram flaps we would do mid abdominal trams for people who had huge bellies and it was too far too, down yeah. yeah so like there there were ways that you could do it and kind of sneak a paniculectomy in to help them out and um, but this this cut is ridiculous. <laughs> So the I'm face. not sure what <laughs> that was the face <laughs> right there. <laughs> I hope we have that on film because that was good because that's exactly what I did. I was like, Burr. you know, you look like the the doggy like hearing a sound they've never heard before. I was just like, what is yeah. that? And so that's so the lesson to the patients is don't make up uh, surgeries and present them to your surgeon because I definitely have had patients do that. Well, can't you just oh, yeah. do this? Can't you just do that? And I'm like, well, there's a reason we don't do that. And maybe in your mind it sounds good, but there's a reason we don't do that. So if you suggest something to your patient, because I think it was a combination of a patient requesting this and the doctor are like coming, it was a patient and a doctor decision. Um, so if you're requesting something and the doctor says, that's not a thing, we don't do that, then, then trust them or maybe go to someone else. And if they tell you the same thing, then that's really not a thing. So trust that. Um, and then just make sure you really know exactly what you're having before you go to surgery and where your intentions are going to be and what the plan is. Um, we have not yet made our way to scarless abdominoplasty. Don't give me a face. <laughs> <laughs> If you have an abdominoplasty, you're going to have scars. So make sure you know where they are. That's coming, isn't it? Along with any scarless other Scarless abdominoplasty. Well, there's already oh, like geez. scarless. Anyways. I can't talk about it. Um, but I think that's, that's it. So that is the deal behind the drainless, painless tummy tuck. Um, as always, as we say all the time when you're choosing your surgeon, do your best to look through any kind of social media marketing Go look at the befores and afters. Make sure it's a look you like. Um, and then just have an honest conversation with your doctor about this. Like, what are the chances I do get a stroma? And if that happens, what do we do? Um, and make a wise, informed decision for yourself about what's important to you and, and what you want. I think that that you nailed it right there. Got nailed it. it. <laughs> well, in that case, this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.